All right. Welcome, Cameron, to the Biohacker Babes podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It'll be fun. Yeah, it's going to be a great conversation. Um, we've been following your work for, I think, about a year now. We first heard about you through Dave Asprey on Bulletproof and been using Kava, and we're really big fans. And you are the go-to expert on everything Kava, and that's why we're so excited to chat with you today. And we were really fortunate enough to actually hear you live at the Biohacking Congress event. Well, live for me, I was there in person, got to meet you in person. Lauren was watching from home. And we learned even more during your presentation. It was just like endless information. So we're really excited to share this with our listeners. I think this might be new to a lot of people. So we're going to start with the basics and get into the nitty gritty. But before we do that, can you start off with your story? How did you first hear about Kava and learn about the amazing benefits of it? No, sure. Well, just kind of, you know, real quick here, I'll kind of encapsulate what Kava is, and then we can kind of jump back to how I found it. Sometimes it, it kind of helps people give some context to sort of where the story was going. Um, right. You know, so Kava generally, right? So it's it's a, a stress-relieving, mood-enhancing sort of nootropic um, plant elixir, a drink that is prepared from the roots of a shrub-like plant that grows in islands in the South Pacific called Piper Methysticum is the name of the plant, is the, uh, is, is the scientific name of the plant. And you know, this is an elixir that's been used for thousands of years by Polynesian and Micronesian cultures in the South Pacific Islands. By South Pacific Islands, I mean islands like Fiji and, and uh, Tonga and Vanuatu is another one. And then obviously everybody is familiar with Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is a big one too. Um, but it's been used there you know, sort of as a social enhancing, anxiety relieving alcohol alternative. They use it in the same context that we use alcohol and coffee. They use it as kind of like a, as a social lubrication, kind of, you know, social enhancing community, you know, your sense of community type of, um, you know, eliciting substance. Uh, and right. So it's been used there, you know, in virtually every social context that you can imagine, you know, for, for, you know, close to 3000 years. So they use it for weddings, funerals, spiritual ceremonies, social gatherings and basically any, any kind of context where people try are trying to come together and sort of connect and open up and, you know, to sort of create that tight knit sense of tribalism and community. Um, so in the West, we've started to embrace it kind of as, as a powerful anxiety reliever mainly, um, you know, because of all the stress related conditions that we have today that are obviously so life limiting. Um, so that's basically what kava is, right? But it's it's that, so it's like alcohol without the drunkenness. It's completely non-addictive, non-habit forming. And if you get it in its food grade form, it's completely non-toxic as well too. Uh, and there are some caveats to that if it's sourced incorrectly or the incorrect parts of the plant are used or it's contaminated. So that's basically what kava is, right? It's kind of in the marketplace in the functional beverage world, it's, it's being looked at at this point as kind of like the next big thing when it comes to like a, you know, biohacking kind of ingredient, you know, functional beverage ingredient. Um, it's, it's really kind of set up to be the next CBD. And, you know, we believe that sometime in the near future, in the next few years, it's going to, it's going to become as common as a cup of coffee and will be, you know, hopefully fully integrated into modern culture and modern life as sort of a, a, a safer means of um, relieving anxiety and getting that sort of, you know, social lubrication without all of the, you know, potentially deleterious effects of, of alcohol and things, right? You know, especially in the time we live in today, that's a very traumatic time in a lot of respects uh, that a lot of people are retreating into various types of addiction. Addiction is going through the roof and you know, mental illness and suicide rates and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so that's basically yeah. what kava is. I came across kava really serendipitously through my own pretty severe health challenges. And um, when I was in my early 20s, I got severely sick with what at the time seemed like kind of like a very rare anomalous type of situation, very rare, unexplainable injurious illness uh, syndrome. Um, but now you know, we kind of see these things as being you know, incredibly more common, right? Because they're becoming incredibly more common to get, you know, very kind of unexplainable illnesses that, that really at their roots uh, are kind of autoimmune in their origin. Um, you know, an autoimmune just basically means an overactivation of the immune system that comes from too much chronic inflammation. And when I think of chronic inflammation, I kind of think of chronic irritation, um, and irritation from the totality of accumulated stressors that we have in our external environment and our internal environment. 
So that's physical stressors, psychological stressors, emotional stressors. And we can definitely think of a few of those right today. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we've got all this, you know, contamination, um, you know, and chemical subluxation that we're under um, that comes from our food supply, that comes from our air. And then we even have, you know, new stresses that we're exposed to today in the form of electromagnetic fields, uh, you know, that we're exposed to in, in, you know, increasing amounts as we, you know, use electromagnetism as a way of communicating. Uh, it's, it's still something that's not fully compatible yet with our bodies. So we've got all these different stressors in this sort of modern technological world that we live in. But so I started to get sick. I was kind of one of these people that had what we call the perfect storm, like in functional medicine, uh, you know, happen in my life where, you know, basically I was a young guy. And at the time, it was a little bit more rare than it even is today um, to see someone who is that young get as sick as I did. I ended up near death and completely incapacitated for a number of years. Um, and it, it happened because of this perfect storm, like all of the fronts sort of came together just right. And the situation exploded and the bottom fell out. So by that, I mean, you know, factors like genetic susceptibility. I definitely had genetic susceptibility to certain forms of toxicity and, and trauma. I had, um, many different toxic exposures, toxic lifestyle habits, including, um, you know, just, you know, stuff in the food, dietary stuff. I was, uh, uh you know, I was exposed to a handful of various, you know, pharmaceutical drugs that I was prescribed to me by a psychiatrist at the time when I was in early college trying to function. Um, I had kind of a metabolic syndrome that was going on. So there was a lot of contributing factors to this. And then I had some huge, you know, sort of emotional traumas and things that happened, um, you know, in my personal life too at the time. Uh, so, so all this stuff happened and, you know, you know, like I was saying, the bottom fell out. And, you know, I developed some minor chronic fatigue at the time. And, uh, you know, I was at, at the time I was, a, I was a very high functioning, uh, you know, young guy. I was, I was, you know, working three jobs. I was, I was going to school. I was, um, I believe I was a junior in college and I was a, I, I was a collegiate athlete. I was a distance runner too, as well. And I was running professionally, you know, racing marathons and stuff too. So overtraining was a contributing factor in my process, um, you know, that kind of was you know, kind of like the icing on the cake. But I got to a point where I got severely chronically fatigued, just thought I was overtraining, sort of backed off for a while. It didn't get better. Um, you know, fatigue turned into more fatigue, brain fog turned into more brain fog. Then I started having all kinds of weird food sensitivities, reactions, inflammatory stuff, aches and pains. I'm thinking, what the heck's going on? And eventually I was really unable to function. I I basically had to withdraw from almost everything that I was doing when it got severe. It got so bad that I couldn't even, I I couldn't even, you know, really make it out of bed. I was having severe cognitive deficits and all different kinds of things. So then I got prescribed all these, these pharmaceutical drugs, the primary one being, you know, amphetamine based like ADHD type of drugs to kind of stimulate the brain. Uh, which is really a bad strategy when you're already in a metabolic deficit, just override the system with psychostimulants, but it did. And I, I got on those and it, that totally hijacked my personality, took me into a very toxic downward spiral, ended up just kind of like destroying what was left of my life at that time. Um, You know, led to all kinds of things, but also just blew out my nervous system. I ended up in a situation where, I was having such severe cognitive deficits post pharmaceutical drugs and this sort of preset set of like metabolic susceptibility um, that I was really unable to drive anymore. I was unable to like leave my house because I'd get confused in, in situations. I was starting to not recognize people in my family. And later on, when I started to get into you know, some of the investigatory work of trying to figure out what was wrong with me, because the standard allopathic model didn't give me any answers besides just more symptom control with drugs and, and, you know, uh, allopathic like interventions, but I ended up getting like functional brain imaging, uh, and, uh, functional brain imaging, meaning like, a what's called a SPECT or a PET scan where they look at brain metabolism, sort of like the, like Daniel Amen's clinics do. If anyone is, is, you know, familiar with some of that work in functional psychiatry. Um, and I got, you know, one of these brain scans and, uh, the radiologist, said that my brain looked very similar to a lot of his 80 year old patients that he had with dementia. And so this was a neurotoxic pattern that was all of these different stressors that came together during this period of time that, you know, you have the pharmaceutical drugs, you got all the bad lifestyle stuff, a few other bad chemical exposures. I was in a moldy apartment. 
that, that had really bad stachybotrys or black mold infestation in it. Um, and that can actually be, you know, deadly, especially at the level that it was at. I was, I had a bunch of pets at the time and like three of my pets died in this apartment just from the, from this, this situation. So you can imagine it was a lot of things that came together and it started me on this process where I completely lost my ability to function on a basic level. So I allocated, I, I had to like move back in with my parents at the time. I became totally dependent. I was basically handicapped. The only thing that I could do was allocate all of the energy and resources mentally that I had left to focusing on scouring medical and scientific literature, um, information, collaborating and calling across the country to various experts, doctors, researchers, scientists. I mean, it was like a full-time job just trying to figure out, okay, what went wrong and why did you know, going to my physician actually make my situation 10 times worse, right? Um, you know, choosing to go this route to sort of giving up responsibility for my health to this third party and not educating myself and understanding what health is and how you build health instead of how you fight disease and how you manage symptoms. So it was just a change in philosophy that I had to get. And then I had to sort of build this new paradigm over a number of years. So I was basically, it was kind of, it was a blessing in disguise because all of my, um, all of my distractions were taken away from me. And the only thing that I had was, you know, my ability to investigate and to just dig really, really deep and to just suck in as much information as I possibly could. And then I had to use experts to help me arrange it and systematize it. And that took basically a long time. I finally, long story short, things got really bad. I ended up, way, I mean, they got way worse before they got better because I wasn't finding enough answers quickly enough, I was continuing to deteriorate. And eventually the reactions that I was, that I was talking about got so bad that I was going into like severe anaphylaxis and having multiple seizures a day, just from being exposed to different foods. These food sensitivities were turning into full blown, like seizure, like convulsions. And so I got to where I couldn't really eat anything. I just got weaker. My system was getting sicker, more toxic. Um, I finally came across a group of, you know, a network of uh, functional medicine doctors and someone introduced me to, um, you know, uh, an expert in the field in cellular detoxification. His name was Dan Pompa. Uh, and I got to be good friends with him. He took me on as a client. I had already seen multiple different people, you know, around the country, but he, he was the one who kind of helped me kind of take that information, systematize it and get a good plan going because detoxification was a good, um, was, was sort of a, uh, you know, at the heart of how I got my life back um, with regenerative medicine and with, you know, various other kinds of nutritional interventions and things. Um, so it was a multi-therapeutic approach that I had to assimilate. But I tell you all that to kind of set up the fact that I, I got to a certain point where even when I started, you know, getting good answers and a system that I could work to start to rebuild my health, I was unable to execute any of the protocols and things that I had in front of me because my reactions to everything were so bad um, and my convulsions that I was having were so bad, right? And I was having these seizures. And so I was put on heavy doses of benzodiazepine drugs, Xanax, Klonopin, drugs like that, which I was opposed to because I'd already been down the drug route. It had like totally torched me, but I had to in order to like eat food, you know, to just, uh, you know, keep these convulsions under control. And the problem was, is that with pharmaceutical drugs, they don't work, you know, these, these single molecules that don't have any intelligence to them that are just like synthetic, um, you know, molecules, which is what pharmaceutical drugs are. Um, they just sort of hack your body and manipulate your body into redistributing its chemistry and using up its stores basically, right? So that you're not creating any more of these brain chemicals, whether you're taking an antidepressant or, a, you know, a psychostimulant or a benzodiazepine, like with the benzos, for example, they work on this pathway called GABA, which is like the main brakes of the nervous system. And they just plug into a receptor, open up the floodgates and basically use up your stores, your expression stores of that particular chemical and activate that pathway. So it's sort of like borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's like charging on credit with your own brain chemistry, right? There's no free lunch when it comes to drugging your brain. It's like people's like, oh, I take this drug and I feel better. It's like, well, today you feel better, tomorrow you feel twice as bad because it's kind of stealing from the system. Plant medicine works totally differently because it's a living organism. Plant medicines are that interface with the body because they come from natural ecology, just like a food does. So they're, they have the same blueprint as the body in, the, in, in a similar uh, way. But anyways, so I was on these heavy doses of these benzodiazepines and they were losing their effectiveness. And the problem with benzodiazepines is, is they're one of the worst, hardest drugs to get off of in the entire 
pharmacopoeia. I mean, it's that and opiates. Um, you can actually die from the withdrawals. And I was so fragile at the time that they were keeping my seizures down, but they were depleting that same system. Like they were depleting my stores of that particular inhibitory system, um, which, uh, which, you know, obviously you get to a point where they lose their effectiveness and then your body ricochets in the opposite direction. And the seizures were already bad enough and my body was weak enough from malnutrition that I was already in a state where these seizures could have been lethal. So I had to find an, a way off of these things, right, safely. So I was looking for, and I couldn't do a lot of the, of the nutritional strategies or the detoxification or the regenerative medicine stuff because my body would react to everything. So I was in this negative feedback loop where I had to kind of get a leg up on it somehow. Um, so I was looking for, I'd already spent kind of years like studying plant medicine at this point, like looking into different options and medical cannabis and the whole thing. But I was looking for a plant-based alternative to a benzodiazepine, right? Something that bounded the same receptors that could kind of prop them up to allow me to to sort of taper off like safely. And I honestly didn't think I was going to find it because benzos are really strong. And there's a lot of these, like, you know, if you look at, you know, the series of plant compounds that are well known that bind to these, these receptors, you know, the GABA receptors, these inhibitory receptors, there's a lot of them that people know of. You can find your health food store. Um, there's, there's valerian root, passion flower, lemon balm, skull cap, you know, mm -hmm. chamomile, all of these bind to those but they bind very lightly. They're very, very light. They're, they're not anywhere near what you would need to like taper off a of benzo. They're helpful if someone is healthy already and they're good herbs, but trying to tackle my situation with those herbs was a little bit like trying to take down an elephant with a BB gun. You know, it's like, it, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it just, it's, it's something, but it's not going to, it's not going to do the job. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was looking for what else was available. I had come across kava before and I knew that kava was like this amazing anxiolytic herb that worked on these pathways. But I, I came across an indigenous islander from the South Pacific, you know, through one of my contacts. And he was asking me like, well, have you tried kava? That's the obvious choice, you know? I mean, it's like our main medicine, our most prized medicinal substance here in the South Pacific, everyone drinks it. I said, well, I've tried kava. I got it from the health food store. I tried several companies from the health food store, you know, two years ago. And it didn't do anything more for me than just like a little bit of chamomile or something like that. It was mildly sedating. And he said, okay, well, what'd you try? And I told him, and then he, he kind of laughed, you know, not that he was laughing at me, but he, you know, he kind of laughed and said, well, that's not kava, right? That's no more like kava than a caffeine pill is like coffee, except the caffeine pill actually works a lot more like coffee than those look more like, like kava. So, mm -hmm. um, so basically I learned this whole process about how extraction really makes a massive difference. Um, and with certain herbs, it, it's like a make or break, like some herbs you can extract with like traditional cookie cutter sort of westernized methods, like using these solvents, just like ethanol or even chemical solvents to grab a few of the actives and you still translate into, um, you know, a portion of the effects. Kava, whenever you extract with solvents, like all of these kava kava capsules in the United States, this, this term kava kava is given to what people think is kava but it's, it's not by definition kava. Uh, you, kava is this full spectrum elixir that's produced from the roots of the shrub. And it's produced in a certain way that you get out the, you know, you know, the full matrix of active synergistic constituents. And they work together to increase bioavailability, absorption, half-life, depth of effects. Um, it's just, it's a mixture that works in synergy with your body. And these solvents that they use, like alcohol or ethanol in the, in the United States to produce these high yield extracts and capsules, they kill like 90% of the effects. So you end up with something that's mildly sedating, but you lose the depth and complexity of the kava experience. Because the, the real kava experience is a very psychological experience. It's a very physiological experience. There's a deep kind of relaxation that can come over you with certain strains. There's also a mind activation. There's also an entheogenic quality to kava in its traditional form, not in its capsule form, not in that, that form you get at the health food store, meaning that it has effects that are kind of akin to um, what's become really popular in these psychedelic compounds that are becoming popular, except for, um, so it, it has a lot of these effects on, you know, inducing these states of like introspective and creative thinking and bringing out feelings of empathy which is why it's really, really good in social context at really opening up and connecting with people. But it does it in a way that doesn't take you into an altered state like a heavy psychedelic would. Like it doesn't, it's not visual in that sense. So it, it doesn't affect your fine motor skills at all. It's like a, a calm enhanced 
state of introspective natural sobriety, right? It kind of like, you know, they have a saying in the islands that, um, that in, in Vanuatu, in the, in the, in the tribes there, um, the village, uh, you know, the people in the village uh, talk about, and they say that a, a man who drinks alcohol becomes a beast, a man who drinks kava becomes more of who he really is. So that's, they kind of, you know, say it in that way. And it, you know, it, it really is true. So the, um, I started to realize this pretty instantly when I started actually drinking kava. So my friend from the South Pacific, he started sending me the dried root, or actually he sent me some of the fresh frozen root to get the full experience. And, um, you know, he was sending it in these, these fresh, uh, you know, frozen bags. And he taught me how to prepare it correctly and everything, basically kneading it into a bowl of hot water, you know, for like 45 minutes. And it was really messy. And I ended up with this big bowl of like muddy water, right? So it's like, it looked really nasty. Um, but I was perfectly happy to, <laughs> to drink that. Like I'll try whatever. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I, I started using it and was just totally blown away. Like it was like night and day. Like it wasn't even the same thing as what I had tried before. Um, it, you know, in like two weeks of using this stuff, I was like, my, my reactions, my sensitivities, my convulsions had reduced by like 80%, um, which was crazy because I didn't expect something to work that fast, but it just sort of, it activated all these neuroprotective pathways that sort of stopped the, um, you know, the convulsatory process before it even started. Um, and it's like, I had tried CBD and all these other things and they were, they were helpful to some degree, but this really, really sort of took care of it. And then after a month of using it, uh, or sorry, after two months of using, it, I was completely off of benzos, uh, so, which is like unheard of. If you think about this, because like usually with benzodiazepines, like you have to do a very careful, concise tapering process. It, it can take sometimes a yeah. year and a half. And even after that, you're left depleted and not totally the same. And I, when I got off of benzos, I felt better than I did before I got on them. Now we know because we're starting to see in the scientific literature that um, that kava has is is eliciting over long term use. You know, traditional kava is is um, you know contributing to GABA receptor upregulation, and we actually see with long term use an increase in GABA receptor density or the creation of new receptors for that pathway and the upregulation of all of those systems that the mobilize resources to that pathway. So it's actually helping not to only acutely give a safe crutch, right, to prop up that system that's weak and depleted, but it actually helps to rehabilitate it also. So it was just miraculous in that, in that standpoint. So not only from trying to get off of benzos, but also trying to get off alcohol, because alcohol affects that pathway as well too. But then also just people who are in these hyper-sympathetically dominant states, like many or most people are today, because they have so much stress and trauma that their body is favored sympathetic and they're very imbalanced. They've depleted that side of the system. They're parasympathetic. This helps to basically rehabilitate or helps the body to re to, to process, um, you know, that stress and that trauma out via, you know, these chemical pathways, but also puts you into this introspective state that allows you to start forming positive associations with past experiences too, which is another thing that we can touch on which is why we're getting, you know, Kavan a lot of, you know, clinical research in the future for PTSD. We think it's going to be, mm. you know, really great because it basically is a protective substance that the indigenous people have seen as a medicine that helps us process all forms of trauma. And we yeah. know that even emotional trauma, which is actually what they prize it more for because they don't have the physical elements that we do. So I got off of benzos in a very short amount of time by taking this. So I was blown away by it. Um, you know, and knew that I wanted to, you know, get involved in it because this just wasn't available to people. I started working with this doctor's network or these functional medicine doctors as I started to get well, because I started to be able to implement all these strategies and got almost completely well by really aggressively going at it with detoxification, nutrition. And then I got into regenerative medicine, stem cells, hyperbaric oxygen, these things, hmm. and really tackled my situation. And in three years, I was I was a good 70, 80% back, totally fully functioning again. It was, which was very miraculous in and of itself. My, my, you know, you know, everything cognitively came back. I mean, this took time. This was a long period of time, but, but, you know, I was able to do it. And Kava was an amazing leverage tool that allowed me to, you know, to do all these other things. So, yeah. so after that, I started. So I just want to this. jump in. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't want you to, I don't go ahead. We'll edit that okay, out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't want you yeah, to so, forget. Okay. Yeah. So, so I started long story short, I started working with this network of functional medicine doctors. They brought me in uh, to start, you know, developing product, designing protocols and in, in, in various things and, you know, you know, being involved in the research side of things. And I started 
doing research for various influencers in the field, uh, you know, for their books and doing a lot of writing, freelance stuff like that. Knew that I wanted to get into the supplement space on my own. I wanted to kind of start this project of trying to, you know, formulate a, um, a, a plan to bring kava and advocate for, you know, safe traditional kava use uh, in the modern world and try to integrate it into not only, you know, the functional medical uh, and biohacking space, but also just in modern culture, right, in the, in the standard retail space. Now, that was a big undertaking. So it took me the better part of, from the time I started it, probably six, seven years to build the fabric of what would eventually become True Kava. Um, I had to develop all the relationships in the islands with, you know, suppliers, get, you know, you know, basically farms developed where, where we, you know, controlled every step of the process, have it to be, you know, pesticide free, growing specific strains, developing and patenting extraction methods, stabilizing methods, and then, you know, you know, developing, you know, various, you know, marketing and distribution relationships to where we could really make a good push to not only, um, you know, push this out there, but also build a movement and an advocacy campaign to integrate real kava into not only American, but sort of, you know, modern culture and life at every layer of the infrastructure. Because I do believe that in various forms, there are various forms and concentrations, some that are stronger that you would want at like alcohol alternative type of thing, some that you'd get at a checkout counter in a retail store. Um, but, but, you know, kava is an amazing tool that absolutely can, and I believe will be as common as coffee or hopefully more common than soda, you know, at, you know, at some point, right? I hope so. Um, yeah. So that's, that's basically where it started. And then we eventually launched the company and, and formulated some really good partnerships and we're going hardcore with it, collaborating with um, even the regulatory agencies to try to get standards established. And uh, we've been involved in a lot of the latest research and things that have come out. So we're heavily involved with you know, laterally across the board, right? With uh, both in the scientific community as well as as in the actual industry. So yeah. Well, I'm I'm sorry to hear all that you went through with your health struggles. I I appreciate. I know you can see the upside of that. That you know you've discovered kava and you're bringing it to the world. And so I'm sorry about your journey, but also grateful and thank you for doing all the work to bring kava. Because I think you're right. Maybe kava is going to be the next coffee bar or alcohol bar, like that would be amazing. Sorry, oh, Lauren, totally. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I, I really want to go all the way back to like uh, 10 minutes ago when you were talking about your perfect storm, because it sounds like a, a lot of people out there are just at the tipping point of that perfect storm. You know, our bucket overflows and we seem so resilient until one day the bucket tips over and it's like, oh God, it's so hard to clean up the storm after it's happened. So can you Obviously, we want to go after inflammation, make sure that we're keeping that at bay in a healthy level. But can you talk about what kava may do to the brain as a neuroprotective agent? Because what I'm really fascinated by is that it could do so many different things from calming down the nervous system to acting as a psychedelic to being like a social engagement. It can be so many different things, but can we bring it back to the, the very main, um, I guess, mechanism of action, what it's doing to your brain tissue oh. and cells? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and in order to understand all the scientific pathways, which is always good to unpack because we've got so much great research and, uh, you know, for those people who are, who are, you know, educated on those pathways, it's, it's good to unpack those. But I like to start with, um, you know, more from a experiential and philosophical standpoint, what kava is, because if we can understand what some of these organisms, whether it be plant, fungal, or even higher vertebrate organisms are, in relation to the natural ecology and their role that they play, it's easier to understand why they do what they do and how one thing can be good for so many things, right? Because a lot, oftentimes people ask, okay, you see, it's good for this and this and this. Why is it good for so many things? We kind of like CBD, today. right? Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and sometimes marketing yeah. takes takes a hold, and then it's it's you know you take like a contribution that it makes uh, on a supportive level, and then people kind of go to like, oh, it, it it ameliorates, it cures this, right? So we're, it's like, I'm so careful about that. It's cause like I, I, in no way it's like in my process, it's not like Kava was like a one-stop shop cure-all. It just magic made it. Pill, an ex yeah. yeah. There is no magic pill. I got my life back and people get their life back through multi-therapeutic approaches of, you know, creating a synergistic, um, uh, protocol or a, you know, plan, basically doing the right combination of things that synergistically work together long enough to where you can shift the body away from disease and towards health and rebuild health. When you rebuild health, disease tends to disappear. 
um, you know, because it's really, you know, your disease is kind of like a lack of health, right? So the health mm-hmm. is failing and you rebuild it. But it takes, you know, approaching it from multiple different levels and doing the basics, you know, obviously, you know, you know, exercise, sleep, nutrition, mindset, all of those things, getting all the basics and then getting into some of more of the, you know, the nitty gritty special stuff. But when it comes but to making calm, sure the nervous system is calm to do all of those things, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so the thing that I like about Kava is that in order, a lot of times people get in this negative feedback loop that I was in, right? And it ends up being this really powerful snowball that has so much momentum and inertia behind it that you can't even interrupt it enough to start getting under the hood to really work because everything is so mm-hmm. traumatic and mm-hmm. the, the fear and the stress and the trauma of the entire process can be so paralyzing. It can be paralyzing or it can make people retreat, right? It can make people just not know what to do or be in such a tizzy or frizzy or they're just so, they can't even, like it makes people want to either turn to drugs just to get some relief, you know, you know, medications, alcohol, or to just retreat and not to deal with any of it because they can't handle it, right? Yeah. Kava is an amazing plant medicine that is kind of like an acutely therapeutic sort of safe crutch, you know, safe plant-based crutch that gives people some acute instantaneous relief instead of like the subtle long-term relief that you get from just basic nutrition or even adaptogenic herbs and different things like that. Um, while also kind of working under the hood at the same time, but by, you know, shutting down the stress system and helping to, to balance that sympathetic parasympathetic out pretty quickly, it helps to sort of interrupt that negative feedback pattern and stop the snowball or at least slow down the snowball. So you can look at everything and start getting to work. Right. So it gives you some relief to where you can actually start to kind of take a breather. You can get, you know, your mood elevated, you can feel better. You can get more energy and motivation and mental clarity and relaxation because that's really what kava is about relaxation mood and mental clarity if there are three things that kind of encapsulate the kava experience and then the and then the introspective stuff the psychological stuff but the state that it puts you in is kind of a state of calm enhanced focus so good kava actually isn't just like a sedative like a benzo will just shut off your brain kava relaxes <laughs> you while engaging you at the same time so which is great because that's where you want to be you want to be in this kind of calm focused alpha state to kind of get into your maximum level of creativity that's actually going to get you out of your circumstances where you can get out of that sort of beta stress, frantic panic state and not be in like dead delta, you know, totally crash state either. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. So, so yeah, so it's, it's a great tool for helping to get the body and the mind into that state, which is why it's just such a great sort of first intervention. And, you know, not to mention, um, you know, if, if you're like a functional medicine practitioner or a health coach or anything, you're trying to help, you know, patients or clients, it's a great thing that you can give people that they see results instantly. And it keeps them interested because a lot of times these, this multi-therapeutic approach, the sum of all the subtleties that gets you well, all the little things, all the, all the details, um, they take time to execute and to implement. And it takes time to see some effects. If you can give them something that's natural, non-addictive, and that they see results off of, it can allow them to take a breather. They'll be able to, to process more of what you're telling them to listen to you. They won't be in this state where they can't do and they're paralyzed by things. So it's a great, it's a great sort of introductory sort of, you know, medicinal substance that kind of helps to interrupt take that the edge off. And, yeah. and it, so, so it does that. I was talking, you know, you know, philosophically from the ecology, Kava's main sort of um, identity, if you will, or, you know, from, a, from its, its main fingerprint or its main identity in the natural ecology is that it's a protective substance, right? So, I mean, we could go into the weeds explaining about what it actually does, but basically, right. you know, I think Kava you said plays... it's called, it's called the great protector. Yes. Yeah. That's, okay. that's what it's starting to be referred to, like in the ethnobotanical wing of the scientific community, okay. um, because it, ha- it plays a very protective role in the natural ecology, right? You know, it's, it, you know, through chemistry, it adapts to stress, obviously by producing a, a whole ray or a complete, you know, subset of, you know, catalytic processes that lead to um, a, a whole host of, of, of adaptive chemistry, basically, right? So basically that means um, it develops a chemical profile that, that, you know, addresses basically every step in the stress adaptation process for all life and biology. And that means everything from plants that's also compatible up to higher vertebrates. And basically what that means, it it develops the chemistry and the signals that help mobilize an adaptation to stress, right? So it's, Mm -hmm. you know, same in our body. You know, it's like, you know, whenever we get, 
you know, confronted with stress, our body kicks out a lot of these inhibitory chemicals, serotonin and endorphins and dopamine. Like whenever, like we're, we're running on the treadmill or we're lifting weights, you know, you get that kind of release of endorphins to kind of like adapt to the pain. Right. And, you know, these plants do the same thing, but some plants play a more protective role to protect, you know, you know, basically, you know, through their, their plant defense compounds, other plant compounds and fungal compounds in the area and other animals as well. Um, and they're exposed to very harsh conditions and attacked a lot by various things. And so they have to develop this robust adaptive chemistry. And that chemistry is like a chemical shield or a buffer against stress. And so whenever human beings take the consumable parts of that plant, you don't want to consume the above ground parts because they're too, um, they're too protective, right? Meaning they contain some of these defense compounds that they don't want toxic? things to eat it. It's, it's irritating um, and it's mildly toxic. It's, is that know, like the, the leaves toxic- and the stems? What yes. part are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. So the, the aerial parts, meaning the leaves and the stems, contain alkaloids that are plant defense compounds and, and, and toxic to the mitochondria. Not to a point even like the level of toxicity has been even over, over accentuated, you know, you know over exacerbated. Um, but it's so, but it can make you sick, right? It can give you a horrible stomach ache. It can make you sick. The indigenous people figured this out years ago. Um, you know, millennia ago, and they've never consumed the aerial parts ever since. So that's why the drink is prepared from the roots, the underground parts that don't produce those because it doesn't, it doesn't have pests, you know, chewing at the roots. So it doesn't need to develop those, but it still has all the adaptive chemistry that helps the internal adaptation, not like, you know, you know, the, you know, the sort of pesticide insecticide, you know, effect of like actually, you know, getting rid of things that eat it. Um, so that's, those are two different things. So it doesn't develop like the bullets or the missiles, but it develops sort of the shield, right? Against mm, the stress. Cool. So, so, you know, the roots and even the basal stump that comes right above the ground are, are the consumable parts of the plant. So basically whenever human beings consume that, it transfers that chemical shield, or that chemical adaptability to you, right? From one organism to another, which is mm. really amazing how that works. So, okay, so how that plays out yeah. in, in the science is, is that all of those pathways that are adaptations against various forms of stress hormones, um, you know, you know, excitatory processes, inflammatory processes, you know, kava hits on virtually every one of them across the board because it's a complete biological organism that's creating that adaptation, and we're a complete biological organism. So it doesn't just develop it for one pathway like we would if we created a pharmaceutical drug. It develops protection across the board, cellular and neural protection across the entire biological spectrum, okay? So the main pathway that it's most well-known for hitting is that GABA pathway. Now, GABA is protective because it opposes glutamate. And glutamate is, um, it's a very important neurotransmitter, but it's like GABA's equal opposite. GABA's like the main brakes of the nervous system. Glutamate's like the main gas. Glutamate's important, but it's very carefully regulated. Um, If it gets too overexcited, it starts to burn out everything in its path it starts to destroy and create inflammation. So basically in any cellular or neural injury that you see, you see what's called excitotoxicity afterwards where the brain's immune system goes crazy. It starts spitting out glutamate in excess and then it starts self-damaging the system with friendly fire. So glutamate is very important to keep under control and that's what's involved in seizure activity. When the system is unable to balance itself from too much irritation, stress, trauma, then it ends up overexpressing this glutamate pathway and sends the system into convulsions, basically shocks it basically to death and starts doing damage. So GABA opposes that. So GABA is protective by shutting down too much excitation that creates damage, right? That storm in the system, right? And it shuts down the stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline that when chronically activated, start to harm the body and, and make it hypoxic and do damage and accelerate the aging process. So there's the mm. GABA pathway it also is an ion channel blocker, like which is the exact mechanism that most anti-seizure meds work on. So ions like sodium and calcium channels, um, when you get an influx of those two things into the cell, which is activated by glutamate and this whole like reactive process, inflammatory process, um, you get an influx of these, these minerals into the cell, um, these ions that, uh, that excite the cell and cause inflammation, cause hydroxyl free radicals and Even, you know, we know now with uh, exposure to electromagnetism, electromagnetic radiation, like microwave radiation, cell phones and everything, we know from, you know, you know, this gentleman named Martin Paul's work that uh, one of the main mechanisms that it damages the DNA is by activating this influx of calcium into the cell, overexciting the cell and creating all this stress and causing this, this DNA damage. 
Um, so, so, yeah, so basically Kava acts as a GABA receptor modulator, an upregulator, without depleting it, upregulates and re-nourishes that system. It blocks um, the over-accentuation of this calcium and this sodium into the cell. It also is a COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor, um, you know, mainly COX-2, mm. which is the same mechanism that uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories work on, except for it's not toxic to the kidneys, or the gut lining, like these drugs are, which is why you have to be incredibly careful mm -hmm. with them. So it's anti-inflammatory. It's also what's called an NRF2 upregulator, which is an adaptive hormetic pathway. So it stimulates your body's natural antioxidant systems, like, you know, glutathione peroxidase, catalase, and superoxide dismutase. Um, so it stimulates your body to pump out and uh, it, it start to express all of these natural sort of antioxidant type of, of uh, systems. So those are just a few of the pathways um, that, you know, from a, a, a neuroprotective and a tissue protective um, standpoint, help to kind of create this biochemical shield that helps to protect us from, from the damaging effects of stress. So whenever we're confronted with stress, it does less damage and it sticks less as a pattern in our system. And freeing us up from that, it also takes us into this psychological introspective alpha state where we can start to reflect and form new, new neural pathways um, that are linked to positive associations with our past experiences because of how it's increasing serotonin and all this other stuff. So it's helping not only to reduce the damaging effects of physical, psychological, emotional, and chemical stress, because emotional stress becomes chemical, becomes cortisol, glutamate, all those things. But it also helps to process the patterns that are locked in there um, and to help our, our body process the trauma, which is actually something that the indigenous people have been talking about for millennia. They don't you know, talk about it in scientific terms. They don't use these terms of these pathways, right? right? They have different language, but they see it more of a, as, as a psychological medicine than they do a physiological because they don't have the kinds of stress related <laughs> massive illness that we do like they live yeah. Yeah. very close into the natural ecology they're tight communities they don't have the kind of depression or anything that we have um they don't have all the glyphosate and the in the pesticides and all this kind of stuff but what they do have just like anybody else is that they they are interested in developing themselves uh and you know developing the the um the fabric of their communities and they see it as when someone has psychological issues someone who consumes comma over a long period of time becomes more introspective, more empathetic, um, and, you know, connects easier with others. And it tends to complexify, um, the, 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 um, the, the range of thought patterns that a person has, just like most entheogens do. A lot of people in Silicon Valley and business owners and things are starting to use microdoses of psychedelics because they increase this connection between left and right hemispheres of the brain. So they elicit and allow for more of this, what, what I call systems thinking. So, um, you know, that, that connection between the left and right brain, you know, the rational, systematic, analytical part and the introspectic, open, um, you know, sort of visionary part um, is very crucial into being able to see the big picture in reality instead of being homed in on your immediate reactive day-to-day step-by-step circumstances, right? Being caught in the rat race and the hamster wheel, which we all tend to do because there's a lot going on and stress puts you in that state where you're just reacting. Um, psychedelics and compounds like this that help, and even meditation and other practices allow you to sort of step back and see the big picture and reflect and, you know, be able to sort of access the trajectory of all of your, not only memories, but also the trajectory of your life and to kind of see it just like, um, like an architect would look at, like at, at a schematic, right? And you can say, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's not good. I don't believe that. I was totally off base there. What's going on there? You know, so you can kind of you look at it like that and, and you're just very, you're more honest with yourself. It's, it's, you know, under these kind of states. And so the indigenous people, like, you know, for, you know, for example, they have a rule in Vanuatu, like the chief who still has kind of reign over the, you know, he kind of has say in the village. Um, if there's a dispute between two parties in the village, they're forced to sit down and settle it over Kava. Like that's, that's it's just part of their culture. Wow, <laughs> oh, that's it's amazing. One of those things. And so it, it helps like they, so in Vanuatu and in Fiji, they have 20 times as many Kava bars as they have regular bars. Westerners have brought alcohol there, but they're like, yeah, you know, like you know, I mean, most of the time, like they still drink it some, but they're like, "This is way better." Like, like I, why? Why would you? I drink this? <laughs> like, it's like because they see at the regular bars, like you know, sometimes it'll be fine, but it's at a certain level, and then sometimes fights will break out, and sometimes this and that, like it just like like, like yeah. alcohol can do. And then everyone feels like crap the next day. They're like, "Why yeah. would I bother with yeah, this?" Yeah, <laughs> it's so toxic. 
and you'll never physically, see a, emotionally. You, you'll never see a fight break out of the kava bar. That will not happen. You know, I mean, it. You know, unless someone's <laughs> not drinking kava there. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just one of those things that like it's so it's there's nothing like it because it leaves you feeling totally sober. Like you don't feel like you're out of control at all. Like, you know, multiple studies have been done looking at, you know, you know, individuals faculties, their, their ability to drive. And, you know, if you go really high crazy doses, you could be a little distracting. You may not want to drive for like 30 minutes, but like, you know, for the most part, (laughs) it's, it leaves your faculties intact and you're not in this state where, you're saying things that you're going to regret or doing things that you're going to regret. In fact, you, you feel more like yourself. And some of the best conversation I've ever had has come like during Kava sessions and maybe with other plant medicine too, but it just, it absolutely opens up this line of connection and communication. That's just very authentic, very genuine, and just leads to not only a great reflective process for yourself, um, but also starts to build these pathways through keeping you in this perspective regularly um, that's more all inclusive, uh, you know. So it's yeah. it's it's really amazing in that sense. I have to say, the first time that I tried it, and I didn't know at the time what it was. I'll keep this short because our audience has heard the story so many times. But I tried it in Hawaii because I didn't want to drink one night, and I saw it was like their mocktail. I had no idea. I was not able to drive. I got in the car. I was like, "This is not going to happen." <laughs> but I really, I felt amazing. And the next day I felt amazing. So Uh, it's, I understand the power of it. And I just think in, in this day and time, so many people can use that, um, from a psychological perspective, like you said, I know you've said healthy individuals make healthy societies. Like if we could Mm -hmm. send this to the masses, we could really do some powerful healing. Do you feel like that is, uh, a practical wish, I guess? Absolutely. I mean, that's part of why we're so passionate about this particular project. I mean, I'm involved in several, you know, projects and involved in you know, product development in several, um, you know, areas of the market and have a lot of things that um, on the, in the pipeline, you know, your things I'd like to do, but this project is very important to me because nobody's doing it right. And there's a lot of overlapping pieces that have to be put together for it to be done right and popularized. And it needs to be done. Sure. Kava can be screwed up so easily. And that's why it hasn't already exploded that's why that's and you know in mm. you know cannabis can too that's why cannabis it took so long for us to finally get this story right oh this is cbd this is marijuana this is it took right. us how many decades to get to there and right. it's like we had to overcome all of these negative connotations and and yeah people, people are still afraid medicine. of it yeah and yeah it's, like, like it's just context matters right it's like you know um you know it's like you know first of all it's like it's 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 an important conversation with kava just like with cannabis or any other plant medicine when people ask about kava, it's like, you have to be clear about what you're talking about because with kava, you have to be clear on the form. Okay. Is it actual kava? Is it the traditional prep? And then two is, is what strain are you, are you consuming? And in what amount as well? Cause there's over 200 different strains of actively used kava. So like you're saying, especially if you're on the more sensitive side of things, you get a really strong shell from the islands. Um, There are some strains of kava that are, that are more heavy that you may want to, you know, just kind of sit and relax for a little while before you do anything because they can be pretty darn strong. Uh, but, mm. you know, most of the, of the noble daily use strains are, are more controlled than that. Um, and they just have a different effect that you're highly productive. It's kind of like the opposite. You're highly productive whenever you use them. So there are some strains that are more daytime strains and some strains that are more nighttime strains. They all affect the GABA pathway. Some also affect the dopamine pathway more. And those are more daytime strains and some are heavier on some of these other pathways, but they all, they all are, are anxiolytic, um, but just some will actually like put you to sleep. Some will just calm you, but not put you to sleep. Some will calm you and activate you and get the wheels turning in a very social way. So there's just like with cannabis, there's a variation of different strains and concentrations as well too. So what we're trying to do is to try to take the ones that are most, you know, the mixtures that are gonna appeal to the most number of people and to standardize that and then create specialty forms because we don't want to confuse people or oversaturate it. It's kind of like introducing something into the market that people can call kava. We're using the strains that are that are most lucrative to the highest number of people that can be most highly tolerated. We keep it within a certain. We develop standards of a chem, of of you know chemical fingerprints. We call chemotypes that we keep it within a certain standardized range that we can say, okay, well this is the baseline that's most tolerable to the most number of people. Um, and then we standardize that and then we go from there and we've got a whole classification system that we've gone from there, but the, 
the first couple of products that we developed are actually not that full blown effect as much that like you experienced in Hawaii or even the full blown effect of a kava drink. They're more controlled. And so like, like the oil that we developed is something that we specifically developed it to be more of a tonic. Like you could take any time of the day, all ages under any circumstance, it more runs in the background and you can put it in your coffee. The coffee enhances the uptake helps even with like intermittent fasting because it helps to suppress appetite and all this stuff and stimulate, you know, ketogenesis and stuff. That, and that's kind of another thing, but the oil is more of like an all purpose kind of food thing, just kind of like MCT, right? We still has the, the broad spectrum effects of kava, but just at a depth and concentration that's very tolerable. So um, you could take I, it morning or night and yes. be fine. And the strain that we use is one that's like in the middle, right? So it's not sedating, but it's not overly activating as well. It's in the middle mm -hmm. that calm focus is what you're going for. It, and with yeah, that yeah. strain, can you modulate your experience depending on what you want? With, with that, um, like depending that, on the dose or time of day, like you can take the same strain and depending on how much you take, you can change the experience. Yeah. Yeah. With that a little bit. Yeah. You can, you can take higher dosage and it's probably going to, it's going to teeter more towards the anxiolytic side and the relaxing side. So you take a lower dosage for your, for your daytime sort of more nootropic type of experience. Um, but for the most part, it's a very balanced strain. That's almost kind of adaptogenic in the nature that it does more at different times of the day, depending on what your body's mm -hmm. doing. Um, yeah. but, uh, it's, it's probably, you know, people like it the most, probably like afternoon to like early evening, probably that's probably when people like it the absolute most. Although there's plenty of people that take it in the morning or multiple times a day with that strain. It's a strain from Vanuatu that's extremely versatile in that regard. So it's really good. We actually are fixing to release our, what we've sort of been building up to for a bit which is our drink and shot line. We have a shot right now. Um, that's like a five hour energy shot, but just it's you know, uh -oh. kava basically. <laughs> I got to uh, try it. Yeah, it's, it, it's a step above you know, the oil, but it's not nearly as strong as what we have coming. What we have coming is comes in a shot form and a drink form. It's gonna come like in 12 ounce cans and glass bottles eventually. Uh, so it's gonna be like what you would get instead of a beer or in, instead of a, a, a kombucha in, in some circumstances. Huh. It's like the full effects of what you'd get at a kava bar, right? Um, mm. so, but in a stabilized carbonated flavor, like it tastes really good. Like it tastes like a, you know, a carbonated drink with like no added sugar. So it's like, it's like keto friendly and all that. Um, and so it's, it's like great. It's very hard to stabilize kava. You prepare it and the effects can dissipate within a few hours or start to grow bacteria and different things. And so, and to get the taste out to where it doesn't taste or feel like muddy water in your mouth, um, for it to actually be a yeah. lucrative drink was there's quite a bit of R and D in that. So this next month, we're going to be releasing these drinks and that's, that's going to be more of like the recreational, you know, highly medicinal effect that you get from kava. We've got, you know, a supplement mm -hmm. product too, that's a concentrate that will be in a capsule that is traditional kava in a capsule that will be on the horizon as well too. So we have these kind of like food drink supplement that we're, that we're trying to focus on. And then we have R and D for other forms, but we're trying to stay focused as we're popularizing it. So people don't get too confused with forms. Um, and we're trying to standardize a balanced form and then specialize into specific forms for like medical application as we go farther into that into the future. Um, but as we're trying to popularize as a lifestyle brand, we want it to be people refer to kava, they're referring to kava, and we have a standardized form of it to where people aren't so confused by different strains and things, you know, um, just from an optic standpoint, uh, so people can get it. Uh, but we will have those available, those specialized forms in the, in the future going into it because we're involved in a lot of the research on dialing that in for clinical application studies, practice and stuff like that. So That's exciting. That's really exciting. Yeah, I can't wait to try like the bigger drink. Um, I, I tried the energy shot and I liked that I got like a really nice clean energy um, at Biohacking Congress, but I'm excited for the drink. So we'll definitely have to stay tuned on that. Oh, the drink is, yeah, the drink is really like from a, all, all those effects that I was talking about as far as like the kava bar type of effects, the, the safe recreational alcohol alternative effects are really where the drink like really shines. Like that's, that's like really yeah. like, which you can adequately, like, it's really the only substances, it's, it's really the only natural substance that really delivers as like an alcohol alternative, right? Like you could actually drink mm -hmm. it like you would drink alcohol and be like, and if it hits with you well and you build it up long enough it, it, that it can, you know, for me, I, I prefer it. Right. You know, so it's, it's a, uh, yeah. So it's, those yeah. effects are extremely exciting just as a safe alternative, you know, um, you know, for the marketplace. But as, yeah. as you were asking about Kava's contribution, like to, um, 
to the modern world and sort of globally. That's something that uh, this company is founded on that I truly believe in because um, like, you know, you had mentioned, I, I had said before, and I have, have said this a lot, in, you know, various podcast interviews and things, um, you know, historically, when we look at, at anthropological accounts of, you know, various cultures across history, especially hunter-gatherer cultures that lived closely, more closely to nature and the natural ecology and the planet, but even indigenous cultures today, you know, basically, um, you know, they all have their forms of, you know, uh, stepping into altered states of various types, right? Uh, and yeah. a lot of it with help of certain natural substances, right? So the altered states that that cultures tend to embrace as their main form of of socializing, relaxing, or building a sense of community, all cultures have them. But you know the cultures who uphold um, you know altered states that uh, say are are plant based in nature or plant medicine related. Um, you know, tend to be much more mentally healthy. And, you know, the highest values and aspirations of a culture are greatly contributed to by the altered states that they choose to engage in, right? Um, so for example, you know, cultures that heavily embrace, say, like alcohol and stimulants as their primary two ways of eliciting altered states for socializing, just have a different you know, generally develop more of a, of, of a value structure that's not as in line with, um, you know, a deep sense of community, nature, the natural ecology, all of those things, even though that stuff still exists because it's an, it's an innate desire of ours. Um, it tends to go more towards sort of the workaholic rat race type of mindset and more of the primitive because those substances bring about more of a primitive state of consciousness and high dosages, right? You know, your alcohol can be okay in certain dosages. It just kind of loosens you up and everything, but you get over a certain amount. Behavior becomes more primitive and you become sort of less introspective and you can make less sense of things. And it kind of activates more of the reactive primitive drives, you know, all of them, right? You know, yeah. and, and, and conversation just becomes more kind of, uh, well, stupid, you know, primitive. <laughs> it just yep. becomes yep. Like, <laughs> simple right it's not it's, there's not much depth to it after a certain point right, right. very surface you know, level yeah and and you know stimulants especially like the the synthetic stimulants put you in more of a beta state that's more of like an analytical left brain sort of rat race sort of get the job done type of state and they suppress creativity and sometimes suppress even empathy and introspection because they take you into that very beta high stress reactive kind of state if you're if you're into it too long there's a time and a place obviously for coffee and different things like that but especially the stimulants that we use pharmaceutically and a lot of things, they can, you know, elicit kind of those things. Now, so if yeah. you look at cultures that say embrace plant medicine, like in the Amazon, like ayahuasca or psilocybin as their main way that they move into altered states together and connect with one another, their value structure usually resembles something of um, highly valuing the natural ecology, for example, highly valuing personal relationships, highly valuing you know, a sense of community or a, a, a tight knit sort of tribe um, or a sense of like, you know, you know, the other taking care of one another. There's just a sense of interconnection that's deepened by those altered states, right? You know, because yeah, it, you know, they move people into these sort of, you know, deeper aspects of themselves. So, you know, so basically, you know, you know, the psychological health reflects that too, obviously, because cultures that embrace those kind of altered states generally have lower rates of depression and mental illness and mental neuroses. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes they, they virtually have no depression at all, um, especially in hunter gatherer cultures that we still see today. So, you know, so basically, you know, healthy minded cultures build healthy societies, obviously, because everything starts with perspective mindset through which we collectively engage in, you know, our, a process moving forward, you know, together in life and on this planet. Uh, you know, so obviously anything that we can do, to move away from the things that are inhibiting that, obviously, inhibiting sort of escapist mentalities, victim mentalities, you know, and em empowering introspective, um, reflective mentalities that elicit a type of honesty, authenticity, and a sense of personal responsibility because we're forced to actually look at our internal circumstances instead of run away from them. You know, anything that accentuates those states of consciousness is going to contribute to positive neurological and perspective development. Uh, and, you know, it, you, you know, individuals collectively um, will, I believe, will start to, uh, you know, reflect that more and more. So I think Kava yes. is one of those tools that if you, if you integrate it into every layer of the infrastructure, 
just like we do alcohol and you have people in these states more often, then I think you're going to get a net positive result from that. That's awesome. Yeah. Cameron, thank you so much. This is so wonderful. Um, I think our audience is like, we're going to buy it right now. We need to have a, <laughs> it is so, so fascinating. We're going to send our audience to your website, of course, but we like to end our interviews with one final piece of advice. If we could simplify it and give our audience just one thing they could start doing today to optimize their health potential. Could you share that with us? Yeah. You know, one thing, um, let's see. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I really think that everything comes down to perspective, right? You know, it's like what you're trying to do whenever you are trying to improve your life or develop yourself or get over a certain boundary or a certain barrier in your life, or just grow as an individual or just pursue happiness, um, which, you know, the right pursuit would probably be more something that resembles meaning and, uh, you know, and, and fulfillment than just a certain feeling trying to get the most out of out of your life. I mean, it, it all comes down to purpose. It's like you can't dissolve or transcend any boundary without first being able to envision doing so, you know? So, you know, engaging with like-minded people that have perspectives that bear fruit and that actually cultivate and create successful outcomes of growth and contribution, um, you know, to culture, to society, to your family, to whoever, um, you know, collaborating and surrounding yourself with those people is probably the best thing you could do because you end up being kind of the sum of like the top 10 people that you immerse yourself in, uh, you know, and around. And, uh, you know, I really think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, what you accumulate in life will never make you happy, right? I think, you know, most people that have been down any of these roads, you know, and chased them down kind of realize that who you become and what you contribute will make you happy or they will make you fulfilled. And so surrounding yourself with those people and doing everything you can to cultivate a perspective that's in line with personal growth, personal responsibility, pulling out your weeds, taking out your own internal trash, addressing your issues, overcoming them and growing. So then you actually have something to give, you know, growing will make you happy and fulfilled. Giving will make you 10 times as happy and fulfilled. Right. And so I think that that's really, really probably the best piece of advice is just to pursue, to pursue meaning instead of happiness, right? To ask yourself what you want out of life instead of, you know, how can I feel good right now um, or what's comfortable right now? Because oftentimes what's comfortable is what's going to inhibit you from growing. Um, and so that's really relevant to this conversation. Obviously, we're talking about kava. Kava is a tool to help you do that. But, you know, doing the work is extremely important. Anything that you can do to your life to start working on yourself and dissolving those boundaries that keep you from being, um, you know, at your highest potential, you know, is it's worth yeah. doing. Life's worth living that way. So that is beautiful yeah, advice. Great. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom. I know I am excited to keep exploring Kava. I think it's such a fascinating topic. Um, but thank you so much for spending so much time with us today and. Thank you to everyone at home that listened. We hope you learned a lot and we will definitely put all the links in the show notes so you can keep learning more. Thanks, Cameron. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it seems so like your true me. Kava across the board, truekava.com is your Instagram also. Yeah, true yeah. Kava. yeah, yeah. It's T-R-U, not T-R-U-E, T-R-U Kava.com. All this stuff is there. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, any of that stuff. So excellent. All, all right, right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.